Welcome to Slash Forward. As you know, most trad holidays exist, not for the sake of crass commercialism, but to provide guidance and caution around what are tolerable behaviors. What does that look like? Well, in the film Saint, we learn the true origins of the jolly fat man who we welcome into our homes like lambs seeking their slaughter. How this connects to how we behave in our daily lives is not clear to me, but take a look and let me know what you think. As we open on a full moon in the sky off the frosty shores of Amsterdam. While Columbus is in equatorial latitudes initiating his genocide, a smaller group of marauding Dutch noblemen are entering a local village. The antipope has come to collect the offerings he demands. As compensation, the guards can help themselves to whatever they want. These things they take, precious metals, carnal pleasures, child servants, are to be left for Saint Nicholas at every full moon upon penalty of robbing them of their precious metals, bodily autonomy, and sturdiest children. However, these proud villagers feel a bit saucy on this chill winter's eve and decline to preserve the proclamation, since it's not the season in which the fields produce their bounty. They instead utilize their simple tools of agriculture to cultivate a fine winter harvest of mutilated bodies. It's then a simple task to row out to the anchored schooner and set it ablaze. They then take great satisfaction in observing as the flames greedily lick the flesh from St. Nick's body. Flash forward to 1968, the good old days. Possibly. I know nothing of this country's history. On another December 5th, under the full moon, we find tradition carries on. As the children bless their meager offerings with joyous pronouncements, they worship the Saint Nicholas of the modern era, a very docile old man that dances around on the television for their entertainment. Young Kurt is sent out to check the hogs, putting a pause on their ritualistic incantations. He makes the short trip, as he has many times before, and goes in to make sure those little bitches are squealing as normal. Normal. And since you can't properly check the swine without tasting a couple, he gets right on in there. Inside, behind the preserves, we see a well-preserved man taking a peek, and then the sound of footsteps on the roof is followed by some of the kids getting sucked up the chimney, and some of them getting juiced in the living room. When Kurt comes out of the barn, he sees the foul beasts on the roof and ducks away. Only after confirming the culprit as Saint Nicholas, and ensuring he's gone, does he go inside to bear witness to the gruesome scene. We then flash forward again to now. Assuming you're watching this on December 5th in 2010, we're on what has to be a college campus, because this one class is doing a secret Nicholas event and are mostly using it as an excuse to buy each other dildos. Except for Frank. Frank got picked by his boo, Sophie, who uses this opportunity to very publicly call him out as a cheater and formally sever their romantic relationship. He stamps out to his moped in a huff, and the boys meet him there to razz him a little and try to raise his spirits. Then he gets on his hog and rips off through the quad. As he passes, the girls cannot believe that Sophie chose to break up with him in that manner. She is so dramatic. They enjoy some lady talk about the act of self-love, which is very scandalous to the virginal Lisa. It's then pointed out that this December 5th is a full moon, and rumors are that Saint Nick has become less discerning about his victims these days. Now duly warned, they all part ways. When Lisa gets to her home, she catches a glimpse of what was possibly a man on her roof, but she's distracted from this when Frank pops out to greet her. We learn that Lisa is the mysterious paramour that Frank had been seen kissing on, and now that he's single, he's ready to go public and be together. But there was never a guarantee of that, and Sophie is still Lisa's best friend. They laugh about how complicated their couplings have become, but seriously, she needs some time. But Frank walked all the way out there, and they kissed once. That means they're going steady. You're just as much of a bitch as you are a best friend. Boyfriend material. Meanwhile, at the local police station, we find young Kurt now grown, well-adjusted, and over his past traumas. If not for his asshole cohorts, it's almost enough for his captain to recommend therapy of all things. I mean, he wrote a report suggesting heightened security on a holiday? That's the sort of thing that scares normal folks, and that's not their job. So instead, he puts Kurt's ass on forced leave until January when all this is blown over. Out in the harbor, the river boys find themselves stranded and waiting for a tugboat to come give them a tug. They get a whiff of what smells like burnt hair right before the radar picks up a vessel moving quickly in their direction. Before they even have the first clue of what's up, they're obliterated by Nicholas's ship. Later on that night, Frank calls Lisa to apologize for his boorish behavior earlier. He was just super horny. Once that's all patched up, he prepares to meet the boys downtown since he's going to be playing St. Nicholas that evening. But his tarot-reading mom has a bad feeling about this. 
something bad is going to happen. However, dressing up for the holidays and frolicking about is a man's obligation. We then sift through various scenes about town. Kurt is at the local dive bar explaining how actually December 5th is Saint Nick's death day, not his birthday. Also, he would know the real Saint Nick if he saw him. Cool story, bro. The boys get themselves all dolled up and ready to hit the streets in their tunics. The rescue boat arrives on the scene and is left to wonder what the hell happened since the boat they came to retrieve is gone. And finally, now properly buzzed up, Kurt trolls the streets, keeping his eye on the kids. Sophie's at home, never taking a break from being cool, smoking cigs, gathering firewood, and generally living that rustic suburban lifestyle. With movement about, will she fire it up in time, and will it help? She is called upstairs by her ward due to noises coming from the roof, but she reassures him it's probably just a burglar since St. Nicholas is a myth. And so also, it really doesn't matter if he's been a rancid little shit this year. Bored, Sophie calls Lisa to check in and offers to help her with her holiday poems. What rhymes with prostate? Upstairs, Timmy is spending the evening being a coward and unobservant and pedestrian in his arts, earning him a visitation. Sophie gets up to check on him, but then the fire is mysteriously quenched. She takes a peek straight up the shaft, and the ensuing sounds of struggle set Lisa to immediate action. She runs as fast as she can in her low-rise slim fits. When she gets to the house, everything is eerily dark and calm. Thankfully, there is no sign of any sort of trouble, other than Sophie's mutilated corpse. Meanwhile, the boys, after hitting roadblocks all over town, reach the end of the line, lost and with nowhere left to go. Panko's got to take a piss, so he hops out to see if he can get his first public urination citation of the evening. Lo and behold, he's holding his Johnson when one of his peers walks up on him, followed by a whole mob. Wondering what's taking so long, Sander pops his head out to shout at Hanko and finds himself impaled from behind. Frank grabs his pole and jumps out to show that he's not one to mess with, even if it's just due to his catastrophically clumsy nature. He ultimately uses the advances of modern technology to his advantage and is able to break free, although he is quickly apprehended by the police for doing their job for them. They hate that, and plus he's dragging around evidence of a crime. And they grill him casually in the interrogation office, while also pumping Lisa for info so they can build a timeline. Given what they've found, he seems like the sort of chap who might have it in him to kill his ex-girlfriend. As they leave, Lisa's mom encourages her daughter to see about finding a new guy who's more of their type of people. When the detective debriefs the captain, we discover that Frank is getting mixed up with other reports of a Saint Nick running around on a great gray horse and terrorizing the populace. Although Frank holds steadfast to his claim that some other folks killed his friends, the captain is then visited by Van Dyke, the fixer you call when you need to get the job done. He's given the task of tracking down Kurt. The captain wants to discuss his disturbing little Nicholas breakdown and its implications regarding Kinder to use it. It's something we're all concerned about, really. At the Kinder ward of the hospital, the nurse makes her rounds before settling into the reception desk to open her December 5th trinket. She's being watched as she unwraps the very average diamond earrings. And then the lights go out. She calls it into maintenance before going to make sure the life support machines are still active but takes pause when she runs across a pile of elf doo-doo in the hall. She and security are quickly dispatched to clear a path for St. Nick to make a special visit with his captive audience of sickly children. Back at the station, Frank is getting his little ass hauled into lockup, while across town, Van Dyke begins his forceful search of Kurt's apartment. They mostly just find a mess and an obsession with the traditions surrounding St. Nicholas. Luckily, he's also very thorough in his note-taking. Circumstances finally shift in Frank's favor as, while he's locked up tight in a squad car, reports are coming in through dispatch of an active pursuit of a man on a horse. It happens to be occurring nearby, but on the rooftops, and St. Nick is absolutely ripping it up. And when the primary pursuit vehicle is taken out of commission, it's up to them to engage the suspect. Officer Jensen thinks back to Academy and presents a textbook perfect technique for subduing a perp riding a magical horse upon housetops, an infraction punishable by death. And the horse, as guilty under the law as the rider, is the only one hit. This causes them to crash into an apartment building and then slide out the side for a little equine revenge. Frank manages to survive and pulls himself out of the wreckage to discover that the horse, already undead, cannot be killed again. He then squats in awe of the terrible majesty of St. Nicholas. Before angry and unlearned, he attempts to neutralize him via gun, a technique that is predictably unsuccessful. Luckily, before he passes out, he's saved by the arrival of the volunteer 
volunteer fire squad. He wakes up at the canal and discovers his savior to be a true believer in Kurt, who knows somehow that the only method for dealing with the crusty old bastard is fire. Kurt tries to talk about dropping him off somewhere, but Frank is feeling entitled to making demands, and he wants to, oh, hey, all right, easy, brother. He stands down, but when the outboard won't turn over, he offers to utilize his mechanical skills under the condition of joining the mission. As they proceed, Kurt catches Frank up on his story and the goal of stopping St. Nick for good. The PR squad tries to keep things calm with the general public. This may be partially due to the captain having no good, solid information. Then Van Dyke arrives to confirm that Kurt's trail has gone cold. But why the subterfuge, you may be wondering. Kurt's theory is it's a cover-up by the Catholic Church due to the bad optics of a murderous apostate bishop running around. It seems somewhat reasonable. In his studies, he came across indicators of how to end the curse. Jesus! And blow him up on his boat at midnight. Lisa gets a call from Frank warning her to stay inside. Then when the police arrive looking for more info, she gets a little taste of how hard it is to convince others that a silly old myth is actually true. Out on the river, the boys follow the acrid smell through the dense fog. They know they're inching closer as they come upon the wreckage of the earlier police boat. Here's a strange and interesting detail for you. They find an officer and a life preserver, and he turns out to be somewhat alive. <laughs> Mostly for scares. They are then approached by another police boat as the officer slips below the surface of the water behind them. This is never addressed again. These colleagues of Kurt are happy to see him, but only because they've been waiting for a chance to witness his comeuppance. So they bring him into the cabin under supervision while trying to figure out what's going on with their nav and comm systems. Unable to troubleshoot, they end up proceeding blindly with a boat full of explosives in tow. Luckily for Kurt's plans, an apparent breakthrough at the Forbidden Harbor piques their interest, bringing them closer to the target. Sure enough, the radar picks up what they believe to be a smuggler's boat. With visions of commendations dancing in their heads, they pull up for a closer look. Is that it? Nah. Kurt tries to get them to turn back, but it's so intriguing. Plus, sounds of wailing children carry on the breeze. They're damn close to believing in all the old myths already when the ghouls finally announce themselves. In the commotion, Kurt is able to use a rapid acceleration and deceleration to shake off most of the riffraff. Nearby, we see that Van Dyke has arrived with a full-on military unit that hits the ground and quickly spreads out. Kurt is still interested in enacting his plan, so he preemptively sets the timer on his detonator, because few things Things are more motivating than a deadline. But as they're hooking everything up, Kurt begins to more quickly die from the appendicitis that has been killing him. He gives the final instructions on how to arm this bitch, just in case, and it ends up being very timely as he keels over. A cut fuel line is rendered moot as the dock already contains a cache of explosives, which Frank uses to improvise a propulsion system. But right at the point of completion, the Delta Squad arrives and brings him back from the edge. They also pick up the boat with people on it and call it in. But their focus lies too far and results in a failure to see the danger before them. But once they do, they spray on them boys. But you know they gotta pause for a minute to check out the fancy trick Saint Nick can do with his special little spear. He comes to have a word with Frank, the naughty boy, who sets off the boat even though its target is unoccupied. However, the explosion does cause Nick to gallop off, which saves Frank's life. Kurt then gets a brief second wind that he uses to ensure his life's work was not in vain. And since it is a holiday, Frank goes ahead and lies to him about the result so he may ooze in delight momentarily before expiring. Frank is then confronted by the officers who offer little solace. The next day, the captain finds himself at the mayor's office awaiting a dressing down. The tally this round is over 300 victims, which is way up from previous incidents. He tasks the captain with finding creative ways to fudge the numbers, since it is, after all, very difficult to take proactive measures to avoid a recurring disaster that occurs on a rigid and predictable cycle. Frank is convalescing when Van Dyke visits to offer him some hush money and confirm they are giving him and Kurt cover stories that paint them in a very positive light in exchange for his silence. Then, after a horrific night terror, Lisa and Frank come to the mutual realization that they are now free to be together. What was Sophie being dead and Lisa's mother approving of Frank due to his heroism. The deal is sealed with a little present.
I'll do the unwrapping for you. But we're left to wonder what's to become of Amsterdam if St. Nicholas doesn't have anywhere to go in the intervening years leading to the next December 5th full moon. Cautionary tales are so important for keeping a society in check, and I feel we've learned a lot here today. Check out this video for a more down-to-earth holiday slaughter. Now that we're here, I want to congratulate you for making it to the end of the video and affirm that you are a very special person because of it. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.